Every moment across the earth, millions fall into a deep, ritualistic passage of rest. There they hallucinate vivid scenes for hours on end before returning to reality. Our memories of these nights quickly fade away and we resume our regular lives. We don't think about sleep. We don't understand it, and we certainly don't value it. I remember being a kid and hating having to go to sleep. I would lay there tossing and turning, desperately wishing that tomorrow could start that very second and I wouldn't have to go through this hassle. And the funny thing is, even though I'm a lot more mature today, I still think of sleep in exactly that same way. My understanding of sleep itself has never evolved, it's never changed, it's just a stupid, annoying, tedious thing that I have to get out of the way before I start my next day. And so I decided to fix that, to try and really understand what sleep is, and more importantly to me, what dreams are. So this is that video. I've always been told that science has no realistic grasp on the concept of why we sleep and why basically every species on the Earth needs to sleep. What I found in my research is that this used to be true, but within my lifetime at least, it's become very much not the case. In fact, it'd be much easier for us to discuss the topic of what sleep doesn't do. To quote the opening paragraphs of Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep, routinely sleeping less than six or seven hours a day demolishes your immune system, more than doubling your risk of cancer. Insufficient sleep is a key lifestyle factor determining whether or not you will develop Alzheimer's disease. Inadequate sleep, even moderate reductions for just one week, disrupts blood sugar levels so profoundly that you would be classified as pre-diabetic, fitting Charlotte Bronte's prophetic wisdom that a ruffled mind makes a restless pillow, sleep disruption further contributes to all major psychiatric conditions, including depression, anxiety, and suicidality. But it's here that we cover the great tragedy of today's discussion, that being society's choice to treat sleep like a disease and not a cure. People tend to connect sleep with laziness. Sleep is the antithesis to work. People want to be working and they hate sleep. People who fail to snap out of sleep or are genetically prone to sleep at irregular times are seen as degenerates of sort. And the entire Western world is constructed so you basically have to miss out on sleep to get ahead. We have school-aged children wake up at extremely irregular hours, we expect them to stay up late at night studying, and in general you are encouraged to burn the candle at both ends. What's ironic is that sleep is one of the most important tools in learning and problem solving, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Sleep is generally caused by two somewhat opposing forces the drive to stay awake, and the pressure to fall asleep. The drive to stay awake is caused by an internal clock in your system known as your circadian rhythm. This is basically how your body knows what time of day it is and when it should cue certain things. It's been shown that even humans who put themselves into isolation away from the sun go through day and night cycles very close to 24 hours in total. This internal system, which knows when it should be day and when it should be night, even if you have no contact with the sun, is also what causes jet lag. I'm looking at a word I'm about to say. Adenosine. A adenosine? The other opposing force, known as sleep pressure, is caused by a buildup of a chemical in your brain known as adenosine. I sound so smart. During sleep, after eight full hours, this chemical is totally wiped out by the brain. The longer you're awake, the more adenosine there is, and thus the more tired you're going to feel because your body wants to fall into rest to get rid of it. As I've mentioned, the two forces of the drive to stay awake and the pressure to fall asleep are completely separate and seemingly unaware of each other, meaning sometimes they can work together, but often they work in opposition of one another. You see, ideally, when your pressure to fall asleep is high and your drive to be awake is low, this is when you would fall asleep. But some people try to cheat the system. You see, if you push yourself through the period of time where you start to feel the pressure to fall asleep, your drive to stay awake will eventually rise again and that will overpower your pressure to fall asleep. This is why people can pull all-nighters where it gets to a point where they don't even feel tired anymore. However, once the drive to stay awake fades, the pressure to fall asleep will be monumentous because you will have an immense amount of adenosine in your system, and thus you will crash, and you will crash hard. Furthermore, doing this has a horrifying effect on your mental and physical health, which is not surprising when you consider that you are essentially tricking your brain into building up an unhealthy amount of a chemical that it is trying to get rid of. 
There are actually two kinds of sleep that you cycle through throughout the night. Rapid eye movement sleep and non-rapid eye movement sleep, aka REM sleep and NREM sleep. During NREM sleep, your brainwaves are sporadic, seemingly unorganized and without rhythm. During REM sleep, meanwhile, your brainwaves are almost exactly like they are when you're awake. While we have thoughts during all phases of sleep, and we have dreams of sorts, it is thought that the dreams during REM sleep are the ones which are most vivid, most memorable, and essentially most connected to what we see as dreams. Now, essentially everything in the animal kingdom exhibits sleep of some form. Only a key group of animals have developed what we call REM sleep, that being mammals and birds. So how does REM sleep affect the brain? What does it give to a human or a cat that a guppy or a cockroach never understands? Let's find out. REM sleep has been connected to the storing of episodic memory, while REM sleep has been connected to procedural and emotional memory. Furthermore, it is REM sleep that shows the greatest talent at connecting different pieces of information. Not just showing the talents of holding on to memories and thoughts, but sporadically connecting one to the next. It's been said that through this talent, REM sleep births creativity and problem solving. Obtaining REM sleep has also been connected to recognizing faces, body language, and other social cues. This allows us to form emotional bonds with other members of our species. But it's when these two things come together, the talent of problem solving and the ability to communicate with other problem solvers, that things really get going. Matthew Walker theorizes in his book, that it was the ability of Homo erectus to travel from sleeping in trees to sleeping on the ground, protected by fire, that allowed us to exhibit longer bouts of REM sleep. With that came societal connections and a much higher intelligence. In other words, REM sleep served the exact same role in our evolution as the monolith in 2001 A Space Odyssey. But that doesn't really answer the biggest question about sleep because it's easy to understand why we go through this process of storing and organizing information in our minds. But what's not easy to grasp is why we seem to do this through a series of vivid hallucinations. I just want to say there are two cats sitting on this bed, and they are fast asleep, and they are adorable, and they are just out of shot, and I am upset, but I really like this angle, and I don't want to wake him up to move him into shot. I just don't know what to do. I'm so conflicted. A long time ago, there was a man named Sigmund Freud. Freud was one of the first mainstream researchers to posit that the process of dreaming comes from the mind itself. He further theorized that imagery in dreaming could be explained as representations of locked away and top secret, disgusting human desires. For a time, Freud's theories were very much respected, but today they're seen as unscientific and kind of stupid. The scientific community hated Freud so much that this actually led to a lot of petty squabbles in the sleep research community. Many sleep scientists came to the conclusion that dreaming itself was like heat from a light bulb. That being that it was an accidental byproduct of something else that the brain was trying to do as we slept and that it had no evolutionary benefits or purpose in the human system. These days, this stance is also seen as unscientific and really, really stupid. The current prevailing stance among sleep scientists is that dreaming is a form of overnight therapy of sorts. It would seem that one of the ways that this helps us is putting us at ease about upsetting events. It's because we are constantly revisiting strong emotions during our dreams that we eventually show the ability to move on. Logically speaking, this process is an incredibly important evolutionary tool. As we sleep, our brain cycles through the information that we have learned during the day and finds what we need to do to survive. Then, the brain constructs a sort of last time sequence for us, a, a narrative based on previous events. Here, we process everything that's happened to us, and we leave the dream feeling much more ready to face whatever is coming next. So the question is, was Freud right to any extent? Can you use your dreams to analyze your subconscious? The answer is, sometimes, 
but not really to the extent that he did it. A lot of your dreams are going to naturally focus on negative emotions that you feel during the day. It takes your anxieties and your deepest fears and it implements these into your visions. But on the other hand, a lot of dreaming is just filler that the mind is coming up with. Morphed and out of place half memories of things thrown in to fill up time. So if you feel like a dream is showing a representation of a very strong emotion that you've been feeling recently, it's very possible that that is actually the case. But it's hard to make the case for theories about consistent symbolism in dreams, because most often than not, it's just random stuff your brain is coming up with. When we sleep, the emotional parts of our brains light up, and the sections that focus on logic power down. It's simply natural that because of this, things in your dream are going to be random and aren't going to make a lot of sense. Your sister will suddenly become a friend from high school, then your friend from high school is going to turn into a kettle pot, then your kettle pot is going to turn into your cat. Hashtag plot hole. Ding! The point isn't to form a complete narrative, it's to connect our current thoughts to previous memories to emotionally stabilize us. You're not even supposed to be able to recognize the discrepancies in these dreams while you're in them. Or at least, that's what people tell me. Whenever I tell people that I lucid dream, uh, they get upset at me, because apparently everyone wants to do this, but I lucid dream? That doesn't mean I'm good at it. To be a lucid dreamer is to be able to recognize when you are in a dream. It is also often connected with the ability to change the dream as you will it. Uh, I didn't get that half of the superpower. Okay, every once in a while, I figure out how to do that in the dream. And my first instinct is always to do the dance from Santa Claus is Coming to Town. Come on, there's a good tailwind blowing. A fast walking man is hard to beat. Yeah, like that mid-air thing. I just do that dance all over my town. <laughs> Usually what happens, however, is that I'll be in a place that I used to visit a lot, or surrounded by people that I used to know, and I'll just connect the fact that they shouldn't be here as if it's a dream, and I spend the rest of the dream trying to convince my friends that none of this is real. Sometimes this goes really badly. I, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like the dream turns on me because I've recognized what it is. And I suddenly have what I can only call dream claustrophobia. Like, where I feel like I'm in a cramped place because I'm, I, ex I realize I exist within the confines of my own mind and I, I spend the rest of the dream trying to escape. But what's a lot more common is I just end up sitting down with these people that I haven't seen in years. And we have a deep conversation. And I somehow convince him. I somehow convince him that this is all a dream. And, and they believe me. And I ask him, does it bother you that this is all a dream? That you're not even real? And they say that it doesn't. That they feel calm. And that itself is evidence. Because they figure if they were real, they'd be really freaked out by the realization that they weren't. I tell them that it's good to see him, and that I miss them. And they say that if they were real, that'd mean a lot. Suddenly I'm alone. Then I wake up. So like I said, I read a couple different books while I was trying to do research for this video, and I thought I'd really quickly review them in case any of you want to do further reading. Uh, the first main one was Sleep, A Very Brief Introduction. Uh, this says Oxford on the front, which I guess means it's Oxford approved, and I think it's written by Oxford teachers. Uh, what I learned during this book is that I am not smart enough to go to Oxford. The one that I've con constantly quoted throughout this video is Why We Sleep, by Matthew Walker, PhD. Uh, from what I've heard, this guy has spent his whole life researching dreams, and he's one of the leading resources. This book basically lays out all the facts that we know about sleep, and it's very interesting and compelling, and basically tells you everything you need to know. Uh, meanwhile, uh, The Mind at Night by Andrea Rock goes through it in a much different way, and as you can tell, 
I, uh, <laughs> I put a lot of notes in this one because it uh, it's really interesting as well. The way she does it is she goes through one researcher at a time and discusses that researcher's journey and what that researcher found out. And you just learn a lot about sleep research and sleep through this process. And it, this is probably the most compelling read. It's the one that you guys would enjoy the most. Then there's Dreamland by David K. Randall. I didn't have time to read that one. But those are my reviews of the books. I don't have anything else in the script, so the rest of this is off the cuff. I guess the biggest thing I've learned from doing all this research is that sleep is incredibly important to maintaining mental and physical health. And it can be so disastrous to skip out on the eight hours a night that we really need. Specifically in these two books, you find out there are so many uh, mental diseases that either are affected by sleep or are potentially caused by sleep. There's apparently been a lot of research about the nature of REM sleep during depression. And if REM sleep actually makes depression worse, because instead of addressing anxieties and fears... It confirms the negative image that we have of ourselves. I mean, that's just an example. There's so much here that I didn't have time to cover. It's really a super interesting topic. With all that, I've been quitting reviews. And that's all you need.